Good afternoon. Today we're going to take a look at some grammars, two in particular. One a simple little pocket grammar, the other a very serious scholarly grammar. But we'll cover the simple first. Anybody that takes their Latin seriously probably uh, has bought or will buy a, a Latin grammar. And for some of you, your textbook will count as that. Uh, your Wheelix Latin textbook is really a grammar. Um, not so much your reading courses. Uh, but if you need one and you want a small one you can carry in your pocket or in your briefcase or book bag, uh, I, I have not found a better one than Collins Pocket Latin uh, Grammar. So it says first edition on it. This was published in 1995. I don't know that there's a second edition. Uh, when I perused the internet to find this copy, I was lucky to find one in such good shape. The, uh, the binding is actually pretty weak, so you have to be very careful how you uh, break this in. I wouldn't do it in cold weather. The, the glue in the binding is actually very temperature sensitive. And so get the book nice and warm and thumb through it gently. Gradually that spine will uh, soften up and you won't break it. But if you're rough, you will break it. And so that's why I say I was, I was lucky to find this one in such good shape because I doubt many survived uh, the, the binding quality being what it is. So this is a very easy Latin grammar to use because if you look at the top of every page, the top of every page is very clearly uh, numbered in bold. And the reason for that is that if you go to the index, bear with me, go to the index, you'll see that a brief description is given of every topic and then immediately there's a page number. Now the first page number is typically like a first mention. Uh, that won't always be the main uh, the main content for that particular subject, but that will be a first mention. So let's say we wanted to know about deponent verbs. Here at the top right hand corner of index 243, you find deponent verbs. First mention is page 22. First conjugation deponent verbs is page 188, second conjugation 190, third and fourth, so on. So let's go to the first, not the first mention, we'll go to the first conjugation, page 188. So we'll flip 185, 186, 187, 188. So here we have a nice little intro description to deponent verbs. You can read that there. The, the print is nice and clear. Uh, you'll notice you'll notice they give you examples in these verb tables and your conjugated ending on the end of each verb is in bold. And so it's, it's, the layout is very nice. Very easy to find individual subjects. Uh, very quick. The way it's laid out catches your eye. So if you want to separate the stem from its ending. It's very easy to do with the bolded lettering here. And one follows right after the other. First conjugation deponent verbs is followed by second, third, and fourth. And so maybe the arrangement isn't necessarily logical in a logical progression, but the way things are grouped is fairly logical. And again, when you look at the bolded page numbers in the corners, it's very easy to find the right page that you're looking for if you begin in the index. You'll also see that for a given subject, in this case it's tenses, there is on the opposing page something titled examples. So prima luce caesar gallos apugnat, that is at the first light Caesar uh, fought with the Gauls, here it says Caesar attacked the Gauls at dawn. Uh, Alexander, Yam tres anos regit. Alexander, already or, or at this point, uh, reigned for three years. And so these are demonstrating various tenses, but the, uh, the nice thing is that you get all these examples to, uh, to show you 
what was explained on the opposing page. And so I like that layout, I like that system. Typically it gives you a full, full orbed, fully fleshed out number of examples to cover all cases. And uh, I, I don't think that could be done any better. Um, in addition to basic grammar, you have your verb tables for all of your irregular verbs. So that's very helpful, especially with the AO verb and uh, Faro and your, uh, your verbs of to be. All those have to be learned by heart. And if not, then you have to look them up all the time. So having a small volume makes these things very easy to look up. Having an excellent index and an excellent numbering system makes it uh, a breeze to use. And the fact that it provides you so many examples of each concept means that you could practically teach yourself the language out of this book uh, if you had a good teacher or were highly motivated. So I recommend this. I don't think I paid much more than $10 for this used. Um, I do wish that they had this available brand new. This one's 25 years old. Good luck finding a nice clean copy. But I would, I would say even if you can't find a nice clean copy, um, any copy uh, with all the pages intact would, would suffice. So I do recommend this highly. Then we have this, uh, this antique here. And I, I don't exaggerate when I say antique. Let's look at the date. Let's look at the publication date. Let's read that. Let's get it to focus. Focus. There we go. 1892. So this thing's pushing 130 years old. Um, it's got a signature in here from its first owner, I'm assuming. The signature is from a Blake Eugene Layton. That's not 1960. If you look close, that's an 8. That's 1860. Uh, possibly his birthday. Um, if that's a 9, that's a very funny 9. It's, a, it's obviously a figure 8. But in any case, uh, look, look at that Look at that nice calligraphy to sign his name. Look at how nice people used to write. So this is something of an artifact, all the writing in it. Um, if we turn the page, you begin to see somebody was writing down their conjugation tables. So bo, b, b, b. Oh, they wrote it wrong. It should be bo, b, 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 boo. Uh, then the future, a, e, 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 e. So somebody was learning grammar translation a long time ago. So 1892. This is called Allen and Grinot's Latin Grammar. So let's look at the title page real quick. Allen and Grinot's. Some, some people really accentuate Grino. They say Allen and Grino. But I say Grino. And you can sue me if you don't like that. Uh, this is for schools and colleges. I would say by this point, even in college, you would not touch this, perhaps not until graduate school. It's founded on comparative grammar, revised and enlarged by James Bradstreet Grinot, assisted by George L. Kittredge. So probably much of this comes from German, because the Germans did more, uh, probably, than any other race of people for furthering the knowledge of Latin. This is really not even a grammar. If we want to be serious, what this is is a book of philology. It's a complete, you might say, master's or even doctorate course in the philological study of Latin. Um, everything that you would want to know and quite a few things that you do not want to know about Latin are, are, are in this book. So we have things like third declension, mute stems, liquid stems, vowel stems, uh, Greek forms, you know, I understand that a lot of people find this very fascinating, and I do too. But the problem is that I don't have the time. I really don't have the time to be delving very deeply into this, and even if you were to commit much of this to memory, uh, you can't really gift it to anyone that wants to know, because this is extremely arcane, you might say. Extreme arcana. 
So here's some things that are more obvious. Adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, interjections, basic parts, parts of speech. Um, they disassemble the Latin language in this book into its most minute details. Look, and the contents just go on and on and on. If you want to know something about Latin, it's probably in this book. If it's not in this book, it's possible that nobody knows. So they, they start with the most basic foundation of letters and sounds. And so they go through the whole litany of the Latin letters, uh, what they sounded like in antiquity, uh, and how they changed. And so uh, very often, very often, valves and consonants would shift over the centuries. And so they begin with uh, Proto-Latin, uh, a very antiquated Latin, and they show how various vowel shifts occurred, how facio becomes fecci, depending on the, uh, the tense, and why that happened. Uh, this is very, very arcane minutia. Uh, some of it quite interesting. If you wanted to know, for instance, why the, the accusative of exclamation is in the accusative, it's because the accusative of exclamation was, was once the direct object of a now no longer present verb and subject. And so, uh, for instance, if you were to wish somebody uh, a good day, you might say, you might say, uh, uh, dies bonum, uh, which is in the accusative. But what you're really saying is you're, you're giving an imperative, uh, habe dies bonum. That is, have a good day. You're wishing somebody uh, the opportunity or you're wishing that somebody will have a good day. And so, good day then becomes the direct object of a verb that's no longer present. So when you say good day to somebody, um, that, that would be in the accusative. Now, I'm injecting an anglicism into Latin, which, which is fine for me, but other people would complain. But... I learned that from, from this book, and also the fact that uh, indirect speech is always in the accusative. So, in indirect speech, that's, I heard that, I think that, I saw that, so-and-so did thus-and-such to thus-and-such. Uh, all of that is in the accusative, and the verbs are in the infinitive, in, in indirect speech. And the reason that uh, both the subject and the direct objects and the infinitive, which is actually a neuter accusative in that case, the reason that they're all in the accusative is because the entire statement, the entire uh, indirect speech acts as the direct object. And so that's the reason, philologically, why indirect speech is in the accusative. So when you can begin to dissect Latin in those terms, and you can understand the why and the how, um, why things are the way they are and how they got that way. You understand Latin in such depth that um, your insights will be, will be very piercing, pierced to the heart of the issue, and your interpretation of the text uh, will, will be very firm, possibly without any fault, because you can, you can support your conclusions so thoroughly. So this book, if you were to study this book, uh, you would be on par, if you could understand it all, you would be on par with anybody holding a Ph.D. in the classics, probably. Um, almost not even a grammar. This is more like a work of philology. Allen and Grinot versus Collins, pocket Latin. Uh, for practical purposes, Collins Latin wins out. It's uh, portable. Very easy to use, very quick to use, very accurate with a lot of examples. Uh, Allen and Grinnell, very cumbersome. It would take a long time to look anything up, even longer to read about it. Uh, you may not understand much of it immediately. But if you're a nerd, if you geek out on stuff like this, if you want to know more than your professor, uh, delve into this. Delve into this, digest it, and see what you come up with. Um, it will give you tremendous insight into all of your Latin uh, translation work. And this was, for a long time, the gold standard in, uh, in Latin grammatical pedagogy.
So give these two a shot. Uh, you'll probably have an easier time finding the Allen and Grinnell simply because this has remained in print, whereas the Collins may not have remained in print. So pick up both of them if you have the spare change. Uh, but again, I would go with the Collins uh, if, if practicality is your primary concern. So you can like this, you can subscribe, you can disagree uh, vehemently in the comment section. Uh, but the more interaction I get, the more I'm encouraged to, uh, to add to the overall corpus of review materials. Uh, if there's enough interest, I may begin, I may begin uh, posting some basic tutorials and parts of speech and basic declension work, basic morphology in Latin. If that's something that people are interested in, uh, give a shout out. Otherwise, you all have a good day and a, good, and a happy 4th of July.